across the UK, across continental North America, and around the world on the internet, by webcast and by podcast. My name is Howard Hughes, and this is The Unexplained. Thank you very much for all of your communications. Um, no shout outs on this edition for a very good reason. We've got a lot of material, a bumper show this time. Um, we're going to be catching up with two guests who made a pretty big impact on my radio show, and I think you deserve to hear them here. Uh, I'll tell you more about them in just a moment. Uh, also, no shout outs on the next edition because I'm hoping to have one of our biggest guests returning to this show. More details of that coming soon. But I promise you, I am seeing and reading all of your emails and guest suggestions. And uh, where necessary, I'm sending an email back. Uh, and I will do that as often as I can. But I see every single email suggestion and thought about the show. Thank you very much for keeping them coming. When you get in touch, please go to the website, theunexplained.tv. There's a link to send email from there. You can make guest suggestions, comments about the show, whatever you want. Please tell me who you are, where you are, and how you use this show. Very important that you do that. If you've made a donation through the website, theunexplained.tv, thank you for that. And thank you to Adam at Creative Hotspot in Liverpool for helping us break records with this show. Thank you, Adam, very much for all of the effort that has gone into all of this over all these years. Um, on this edition of the show, then, two great guests. Number one, Paul Sinclair, the author of a book about strange happenings off the coast of Yorkshire, um, the east coast of the UK, this is essentially, uh, up northeast of London town, where some weirdness has happened. Not only lights in the sky, but also <sighs> UFOs, people going missing in tragic circumstances, all in recent years. It is a remarkable book. Paul Sinclair is a fantastic guest. He has a second edition of the book coming out very soon, hot on the heels of this one. The book is called Truth Proof. I massively recommend it. Um, you know, I don't endorse people here, but I do recommend this book. It's a great piece of research and a great read, and he is a fantastic guest. So Paul Sinclair, number one, uh, from my uh, UK talk radio show. Also, uh, the second guest is Dave O'Brien. Uh, in the light of the 2800 JFK documents that have just been released by Donald J. Trump, uh, he authorized their release. Uh, 300 more documents remain secret. What more do we know? Well, Dave O'Brien has written a great book called Through the Oswald Window. He's done a lot of research. He's based in Canada. Um, and I get his thoughts about these new documents, plus some thoughts about his book. Another superb guest on The Unexplained. So two people you really need to hear. So strap yourself in. And I do hope wherever in the world you are, you really enjoy this edition of The Unexplained. Let's start with Paul Sinclair. And we'll talk about his book and research, Truth Proof. A whole series of anomalies, strange happenings, aliens, strange craft, lights in the sky, and very disturbingly disappearing people all in the same area, all with certain factors in common, geographically at least. The area we're talking about is the eastern North Yorkshire coast. And the person who's done so much research for this 240-page book, uh, Truth Proof, is Paul Sinclair. He's online to us now uh, at The Unexplained. You are in Yorkshire, aren't you, Paul? I am, yes, Howard, and well, wonderful to talk to you tonight. Thank uh, you. You too. This is a great book. You know, I was uh, reading through it uh, today and marking it up for this conversation. Uh, it's beautifully written and fabulously researched, and, you know, you haven't taken other people's accounts of things. Uh, with a lot of these cases, you've actually gone and spoken. If you can't get the people themselves, you've spoken to people who knew them or know them. Uh, it's, it's a great bit of research. How long did it take to put together? Uh, the book itself, I'd had lots of ideas and different stories had come to me over the years, but when I decided to actually write the book, I would have thought about 12 months. And the second one's come together quite a lot quicker, if I'm being truthful, Howard. Mm. And what is it about this area? I mean, maybe every area is a bit like this, and you've centred on this area, but what what is it that makes this area of East and North Yorkshire um, and the coast there so strange? Yeah, so unique. It's probably, you touched on, on part of it when you just spoke then. There's probably areas all over the country, all over the world that are similar to this. But obviously these pockets, these pockets of eye strangeness, and you've got, when if you read Truth Booth, you, you would understand that they are here, they do exist in eastern North Yorkshire. It, I think it's the land, it's the location that's the key. The, the, there's the huge amount of burial mounds that are situated around the area. They they weren't placed there because of because of because the people thought that 
they would like to place a burial mound there for, for want of a better word. They realise the significance of this highly strange land and the things that manifest and are, are seen in the area. Uh, basically, I think location is key. Mm. Uh, location we, is key. I mean, it's, it is all about location, location, location. And that is why the military chose that area, for example, air bases, because it has a great takeoff to, I mean, literally, you turn left and you're up to Scandinavia. You turn right, you're down to Germany and Holland. Uh, you go straight across and you're into Vladivostok. So it's a, it is a, strategically, it's a great area. That's, co that's correct. I mean, you just touched on RAF bases and you've got RAF Staxton Wold, which is the oldest operational RAF base in the world, situated just outside of Scarborough and about 11 miles as the crow flies from Bridlington. And once again, an area of high strangeness. I'm not saying that the RAF placed that base there because of that, but the amount of stories and the amount of information that comes out from a in close proximity to that base is amazing mm -hmm. and and no less amazing is the disused RAF base at Bempton. And RAF there are Bempton. so many stories that we're going to go through that all come back to Bempton even though Bempton is not used anymore uh, the buildings are still there and they seem to be the focus of some uh, maybe a lot of it is folklore but going into the detail of some of the stories in your book I'm not sure how it can all be folklore. I would agree, and and let's not forget that folklore. That's 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 oral accounts. Before, before many of these people wouldn't have been able to write, and who's to say that what they witnessed and experienced was not a genuine unknown phenomena? You know, we call it folklore, as, and sort of brush it to one side as though it's not to be taken as serious. But these are old tales, and if they were being retold today. Or, or I, let's assume I'm creating folklore of today. I'm writing it. Mm. It's just it's not the spoken word. I'm I'm putting it up down on print in, in print. But the fact of the matter is that some of the people, and like I say, we've got loads of stories to get into, and we've got time to do it. You know, you have talked to sensible, grown-up people who claim to have had experiences that are beyond sensible. They are bizarre. I tell you, I've just had a. A text in uh, from Chris, who's the editor of Outer Limits magazine. You might even know him, Chris Evers. I know Chris Evers, yeah. Wonderful magazine, puts wonderful UFO conferences on now in Hull. Well, you might Maybe. know about this. He says, and before we get into your stories, he says, do you believe that there is an anomaly or some kind of interdimensional portal in the North Sea off Bridlington uh, that has caused and continues to cause weird experiences? What? Well, it's a, I suppose it's a possibility. In truth proof, I've never, I've, I don't pin anything down to any one thing because ultimately I simply don't know. But I know old maps and old naval maps do say on them a magnetic anomaly is supposed to exist in this area. Mm. And I've spoke to numerous trawlermen uh, in Bridlington Harbour and other locations around the East Coast who tell me that when they get 16 to 20 miles off Flamborough Head, on very rare occasions, and we're talking so rare it could happen once in ten years, their compasses just go wild. Mm. All right, we'll get into that because it's a kind of Bermuda Triangle effect. Let's let's unpick the book and we'll go through it from page one okay. and pick out stories all the way through. I, I, I spent a really happy couple of hours today doing this. Um, I, I didn't know what to expect. I thought, oh, the cover on this looks good. I've no idea what the book is going to be like, and I was really impressed. Okay, page one, strange lights um, seen miles out to sea. Uh, that have been described by some people and newspapers as Chinese lanterns, but because of the way they appear, how can they be seen near and off Flamborough Head? Uh, you have recorded examples of those in the book. I've recorded examples of those, and I've got actual video footage of them. It was the trawlermen and the rock anglers off Bempton who fish those cliffs from the uh, 1st of March every year uh, for a few months... Uh, sorry, the, yeah, the 1st of March for a few months, and they're there on a night fishing off the cliffs, and they've been reporting these unusual red and orange spheres that just appear. One light will appear in the sky over the sea uh, and instantly punch into a row of five, switch off and appear further down the coast. Now, if you get speaking, Howard, to a uh, lifeboat crew and you're lucky enough to look at some of their logs, which I've, I've been able to over the years, and I've sort of opened their eyes a little bit. I don't mean I've learnt them, but we get loads of reports in the newspapers, the local papers of red flares seen off East Yorkshire, red flares seen off Hornsey from Hull. 
and they go out and sometimes they'll have nine hour searches for these boats or aircraft in distress you know downed aircraft or boats what, so they, they would actually be deployed uh, well, to something deployed. that is unexplained well, they, 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 everybody wants to explain it in conventional terms. That's the human thing to do. So the follow-up in the, the paper the following week would read something like, I mean, I haven't got a paper in front of me. The, it, it was a false alarm, the nine-hour search for the flares. I've named them the flares that never were. These are the light forms. These things, I don't know whether they, they're alive. I don't know what they are. And some of your listeners may roll their eyes listening to this but let me assure you the lifeboat men are, are taking me serious now some of them because when they look back in their logs the, the amount of call outs they've had for flares over the sea off scarborough off bridlington off hornsey four hour searches five hour searches and then the following week the newspaper write-up will say that they were perhaps meteors or afterburners and, or they, and how can they be chinese lanterns which some people said they were they can't be out at sea can they not really, and not only that, Howard, the, the explanations given, they're given a cluster of explanations all for, for the sighting the week previous, because quite honestly, they do not know. I mean, if, and I've, I've not got an answer to this. I'm not saying they're UFOs, but I'm saying that these lights, which I've termed ILFs, intelligent light forms, are real and do exist. I've spent years on the East Yorkshire Wolds, uh, spending time with farmers who've, who've in remote areas who've seen these spheres of light that just appear at will and vanish uh, you know and, and the fishermen will say a row of five appeared and then it switched off and then it appeared in hornsey we could see it six miles down the coast that's not flares that's not afterburners and that's not meteorites and we, we we've seen we've seen them to be honest with you once this year but late last year, we, we managed to get a bit of film footage of them because they're just quite unpredictable. If this if this phenomena was predictable, Howard, then everybody would be seeing it. But it is a genuine unknown. And that's as much as I can say for the light form. Have, have you yeah. tried phoning the Ministry of Defence about this? Uh, not about the light forms, no. I, I did about uh, when I was looking into some aircraft crashes off the North Sea, and you touched on it earlier. You said we're looking into a Bermuda Triangle type thing. And when I spoke to the historical records office about ZA610, which was a tornado, tornado that crashed in December 1985, that when as soon as I told them where it was, and it could have been tongue in cheek, but the guy on the phone said, we call that area the Bermuda Triangle of the UK which is an interesting, I used it in the book, I thought that's too good not to say. Mm. You know, m you know, maybe he was too... That was asking to be said, really. Uh, do you mind if I read just a little bit from the book? Are you all right with that? Read whatever you like, Howard. You're not going to come breathing down my neck for copyright. No. OK. No. Uh, yeah. Page six, we're talking about lights. Uh, this is the story about an angler. You spoke to somebody who told you the story of an angler. A lot of these stories involve people who fish, whether they go out in trawlers or they fish from the coast themselves. This person used to park his car at the reserve, which is the Bempton Reserve. There's that name, Bempton. And then go onto the cliff tops for fishing. He said that on one particular evening, just before they closed the centre, the angler came in and he was shaken up and seemed very frightened. He told them how he'd set up his fishing gear and had been sitting on the cliff top looking out to sea. The sky was full of stars, and he suddenly noticed a very bright star that he couldn't recall having ever seen before. It was just there. He said that he looked hard at the star, but no sooner had he focused on it, the star was right on top of him, right above him. He couldn't explain it any other way. He said, for a few seconds, the ground all around him lit up in the most brilliant light. It was so intense that everything around him was white. Even the grass shimmered in a silver white brilliance. Then it vanished as quickly as it arrived. And this guy was really frightened. And I'm guessing there is no way that that could have been a helicopter. There's absolutely no way. I mean, I've spoke to him several times and quite recently. I was lucky enough, I'll not dwell on the what I, why I was at Bempton. I was fitting a floor safe in the nature reserve and I was told the story and then I located the fisherman. What's interesting, obviously, it couldn't have been a star that appeared above this man's head, but he, he perceived it as a star up in the heavens. Now, I don't know if there's something going off. There was some intermined connection with this object that he viewed and this thing that appeared instantly. I don't think he was hallucinating. He, he came back to the centre, absolutely shook up, and he tells me that he won't fish alone up at Bempton again. 
uh, quite what were going off, I don't know. I mean, a lot of the fishermen have experienced not something as dramatic as that, but the light forms. And if you speak to ten fish, well, if you speak to five fishermen, you'll get five different answers to what they are. Some will say they're afterburners, and when you'll say to them, did you hear aircraft at the time? They'll say, no, no, we never heard anything. And, uh, and, and the next guy will say, there were meteorites. And so what's... And what did they do? Oh, they just hung in the sky in a row of five. And, you know, these, these people are, you know, they're not presumably science fiction fans, so you know, they, they, they've got no vested interest in making this stuff up, I would have thought. Howard, they've got absolutely no interest in UFOs or, or unidentified flying objects. All they want to do is catch fish off the cliff top. Um, I'm glad this book is stuffed with stories, literally page to page. So we skip from page six and the fishermen uh, to the light form encounter in Whitby, 1984. They're all recent stories. They're all within 30, 40 years. There is one little excursion into 1966 for a good reason. We'll talk about that in a bit. Howard. Sorry? What page are we on? We're on page eight. And, oh, and this is uh, a witness who first contacted me via a, some website about a light form sighting. Uh, and the quote is here, my car broke down on top of a deserted moor road. My girlfriend and I had no choice but to leave the car and walk home. We saw a red light, didn't take a lot of notice at first, assuming it was a tail light of a motorbike. Our primary concern was to get home. We were on foot. Da 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 da. I started to walk slowly towards it. Uh, yep. Yet it stayed where it was. My reasoning was that we were vulnerable up there, and if we wanted to, it could have hurt us, but it didn't. So we had nothing to lose and everything to gain from investigating it. My girlfriend was frightened at the thought of me going over to the red light and leaving her, and she started crying, please don't leave me. I said she should come with me then, but she became frightened at the thought of that also. What was it? They, they, you've got a great sketch here, light form encounter in Whitby, a red hovering light in front of two two young people what was it well it is what what i've been talking about and these are the intelligent light forms if we're to believe this guy's account and he was a qualified kind of guy a hypnoanalysis i, I believe uh, by profession and he actually says somewhere you'll have to forgive me because i can't see it on the page but he actually says that he believed that this was thing was suggesting or saying to him inside his head don't worry, I, you, you, you won't be harmed, or words to that effect. And, yeah, there was some kind of uh, uh, an awareness to this object that, that sort of paced them at the the way they were walking across the moor after they'd broken down. And, obviously, if the girlfriend hadn't have been frightened, I think he, I don't mean he'd have touched it or had some kind of wonderful interaction, but he might have been lucky enough to study more and, and glean more information from it. Mm. I mean, you say visual sightings. One of the uh, chapter, well, one of the section headings is visual sightings equals mental connection. In other I words, so. the feeling that you're connected with whatever this is. Well, the guy on the cliff tops that you spoke about earlier, and he he, he visualised that star and or what he perceived to be a star that he couldn't place bef seeing before. And once he'd made that connection, he, he claims that this light was above him instantly, so, so some kind of intermind connection. And it's almost as though when different people view a UFO sighting, a, a multiple witnesses, and they won't all describe it in, in the same way, and they, it, everybody seems to have a slightly different take on it. They will all agree that they've seen something, but they have a different experience in, in many instances. I mean, and this is a skeptic's dream scenario because because they can't all agree on it. Yeah. But I, I'd sort of turn that on its head and say that there's, there's something happening on a personal level with each and every witness. I mean, they'll all agree that they've seen something unusual, but usually they perceive it or experience it in a different way, and mm. some will fear and some will feel absolute excitement. Well, you'd be surprised at the number of people who are chiming in with you here. Uh, Stuart is one of them. Uh, Stuart says, uh, have seen some weird things up on the moor near Whitby, but assumed it was all military. Yeah, well, yeah, you know, and that's and, and and who's to say a lot of this can't be military, but w what I'm saying is, Howard, that a lot of it isn't. The lights over the sea, I, there's no explanation when when the, when the people come out with afterburners for a row, a, a light that instantly punches into a row of five and then travels down the coast like a train, or, or switches off and appears in a different part. I mean, I've seen these myself. I took a guy out uh, last year up on up to the uh, RSPB reserve 
uh, geophysicist Andrew Eels, and he's written a paper for new book because he witnessed them, and he, he, he was far cleverer than me, and he, he worked out the distance from the cliffs to the horizon from from our altitude of 22 miles, and he, he sort of did, really did a job on it, and he's no explanation for these, and these are trained men. I'm mm. I, I, I investigate these things, but this guy put his brain to it, and it's good to see somebody from a scientific background taking it seriously. Now we've got two minutes before news here, so just want to deal with this. My friend Mark from the band The Pocket Gods, who are doing uh, very well with their indie music, uh, which is uh, rapidly in danger of going completely mainstream, and I'm very proud of them because I'm on a couple of their albums. I'm just. <laughs> adding that for uh, adding that for flavor, really. Mark says, um, "Do you believe that UFOs are attracted because of military bases?" I mean, you've talked about Benton. Benton will come into this again after the news in other stories about other kinds of strangeness. But Mark is putting that point: the attraction they, of strange lights, UFOs, whatever it might be, energies and they, they, military things. Yeah, they, they, it could very well be when you look at Rendlesham Forest. And, and the alleged UFO sighting in 1980, and there's people still investigating that and still pouring enormous amounts of effort and, and investigation skills. People like Derek Savori and, and John Hansen, and they, they're absolutely, and Brenda Butler, they're, they're still working very hard, and that's 1980. You know, and, and yeah, so the military bases must, must form a part of it. I don't know whether it's because of the potential for weapons or the, the uh, radar, uh, antenna at the, the energy outputs. I don't know what the reason is, uh, or the intelligence that's withheld in these bases. I really don't know, but it does appear that way. Yeah. The book is called Truth Proof. I haven't said book this time. I'm going back to my Liverpool roots now. Book. You're going to go get a book down there, you know. Um, Paul, uh, the Grim Sheeper great uh, Twitter handle, has just uh, tweeted in and says, Howard, can you ask Paul about a building on the North Yorkshire Moors, the North York's Moors? It's a big concrete square with no visible ways in or windows. Are you aware of this? That sounds a bit Filingdales to me. <laughs> I honestly thought that's what he was referring to. If not, then I'm not aware of it. It would have to be Filingdales uh, near Golfland, I would have thought. Well, Sarah, madam, if you can give me some more details of that, we'll uh, we'll try and check that one out. And thank you for it. You can always tweet at Talk Radio throughout the show. I mean, I love the running commentary that goes on when we're on air here. Uh, it's just one of the great things about the show. So many stories in this book and so little time to get through them, I think you will find. Where are we going to go next? Let me see. Um, page 27. A strange case reported by a fisherman of light coming up from the sea. Not lights hanging over the land or lights hanging over the sea, but strange, what do they call it, luminescence, marine luminescence coming up from under the sea. Uh, on page 27, even a Coast Guard officer based at Bridlington uh, thought that these lights were really unusual. What's that all about? It's, it's, just, it's just another anomaly that's been reported for many years, and, and this one is... <laughs> is, is, is no less interesting than the others. I mean, I, if I could just briefly jump from this, this year, uh, with, a, with a witness called Bob Brown, who happens to be a radio host, really? uh, we filmed, uh, we got pictures of lights under the sea off Bempton, a triangle of lights under the sea. A however. triangle of lights? I, I am, I'm not going to say that the tri anything, a, a group of three is going to form a triangle, isn't it? But there were a group of three lights. Now, I'm not trying in any way to suggest that they were some huge object under the sea but nevertheless we've got these lights these luminous white lights filmed in in daylight over the sea well early evening and uh, it's what's interesting i know i've jumped from your story here howard but uh, american military vehicles were in our area at the time of this sighting dodge ram pickups which i often photographs of as well to back up my words with huge green camouflage boxes on the back i'd be very interested if anybody well, in these the americans had their hardware near the, this area well they, they were they were american license plates and they were dodge ram pickups i know because i passed one at close quarters and and got a few images and they've got an, an item on the top that looked like a satellite dish they were camouflage green uh, I don't know whether there was, the Dodge Rams were civilian because they were dark blue, but the the kit the kit on the back of them was military. They had right. a huge trailer on the back that were all camouflaged up, and I was told by 
friends of mine who were in the military, when I showed them the images of what was on top, it was nothing to do with the satellite. They said it was microwave technology. Now, they were parked at Bempton. They were at Garton on the Wolds. They were at Sledmere and they were at Gransmore. Just remind, thought, tell me again when this was. I, I would have thought two months ago. OK, well, look, uh, you know, we know that all sorts of things have to be done for our safety and our defence. But that yeah. sounds rather strange. I can't recall seeing American uh, reg plate military vehicles uh, anywhere in my lifetime in well, this country. Uh, uh, if anybody wanted to look on my Facebook page, I did put pictures up of them. You know, and uh, quite why they were there, I don't know. I mean, I'd spoke to some farmers in area and, and locals who'd passed as they were walking the dogs because one of them were parked on a lane called Blake Lane, just off Bempton, just off Cliff Lane at, at Bempton. And he asked what they were doing, and they said that there'd been some unusual aircraft seen. And this is not to say that that's not why, that's why, they, weren't, why they were there. I mean, it, it could have been perfectly legitimate not everything's got to be ufo related or unexplained but it is highly unusual there was nothing reported in papers about these aircraft about these uh, dodge rams with these strange units on the back i mean it was a square box that were camouflaged up you could probably got two people working inside it steel flaps around the top well, i would be very keen to know about that because that sounds like something from the cold war we know that the east of england uh, was used for something called over the horizon radar we were very big into that at one point but i wonder what this could be uh, just an update on that um, strange concrete um, item on the moors uh, that had no visible way in um the grim sheeper says uh, not filing dales definitely not filing dales um i'm familiar with that because i've driven past it lots of times this was okay on the moors while I was driving. So that's one to check out. Yeah, um, I've also got a phone number, which I'm obviously not going to give out on air, for John Alexander, who uh, was uh, uh, of interest to you. So we can put the two of you in t into contact. I will email you that when we've done this. But uh, we can't give out numbers on the air, but we will do that. OK, let's get to uh, another case. There are so many in here and so little time. This is great. Uh, page 29, what you call the Witham Sea Close Encounter. Uh, this happened in all these cases, most of them are very recent. 19, well, you know, to me it's recent, 1994. Um, hovering spheres, the air was buzzing with static. Um, loud noises, something that caused alarms to go off. And the people who spotted this uh, were rational people. I'm just going to get to page 29 here so I can actually read a little bit of this. Uh, March, here it is, the Witham Sea Close Encounter. Okay, now you were able to find out about this in March 2006, so 12 years, no, 20, 22 years after it happened, wasn't it? Hang we went on. to interview these Hang ladies. On, no, how many years is... No, it's 12 years. It's been a yep. long, long week with too little sleep. Um, you say, March night, 2006, I was contacted by a freelance reporter from Bridlington. Uh, she asked if I would interview an older lady and her daughter about a terrifying encounter they both experienced when they lived on a farm in Sprotley near Withensee, just east of Hull. This is a great story. I don't know whether you can flesh this out without me reading from your book. Yeah, yeah that, um, by all means. They lived in uh, Nairsborough when we went to speak to them and I went with a guy called Steve Ashbridge and basically what they encountered the daughter Sandra was washing the pots in a uh, late evening in their kitchen at the it was a chicken farm that they were living on uh, in 1994 and she observed some lights in the distance from a kitchen window unpolluted nothing at the back of them just open skies and she was interested so she went to a back door and she's observing these lights, and she shouted her mum, Muriel. And Muriel, when we met her, would have been in her late 70s, so I don't know if she's around yet, but still. So anyway, Sandra decided that she was going to run upstairs and get a camera. And she went and got this, you know, picture the cameras with the square flash that turned when you take the pictures. Oh, yeah, um, I used to have one of those, a, uh, what a code, Instamatic. Remember yeah, those? So God. She, she snapped a picture of these lights stood in the doorway, and instantly... I don't, I'm not going to say how many seconds or a second. These lights were at, at the bottom of their garden or the, the grassy area at the bottom of their... And they were just hung in a row. Spheres of light. And she said they were turning. She, it was so difficult for them to explain what they were actually looking at. And she said they were turning and they looked like a rack of snooker balls at, at one time. And they were turning and they, see, they didn't have eyes, but they sort of turned half black and half red. And to the right, if, I'm, if my memory serves me correctly, there was a white sphere that she thought had some kind of shutter or door on it. 
they didn't know if it landed or if if it was hovering in the field but when they shot forward after a few seconds they went inside locked the door and they were frightened to death now well i can't say what part of the room were in but they, they were just in the back of the room frightened and after a short time with the lights off Sandra, the, the daughter, said that she could hear or perceive movement outside and she went to the window and just snapped a few pictures. And she'd got through through the sort of vagueness of the neck curtains this, this image of what she says is an alien. Now, me and Steve believed her story, we, but afterwards it had such a profound effect on these two ladies that everything that happened after that they believed was UFO related and I th with no disrespect to them mm. but I think even a satellite passing the sky through the sky would have caused them to be looking up and interested uh, but we, we do think that the initial event was genuine it was a genuine UFO related I event that they they had had and these pictures are quite remarkable and they allowed me to take a few snaps from their own pictures and I've, I've placed them in, in the book Truth Proof I don't know if you've seen them Howard uh, but uh, yeah, quite uh, quite amazing. Well, you know, and, and again, these are not people who were uh, sci-fi fans or you know Ridley Scott fans or anything particularly. They're just a couple, an ordinary couple of people. No interest. Muriel whatsoever. and Sandra. And what was interesting, because of the difference in upbringings and cultural backgrounds, Sandra believed that they were aliens, and Muriel believed they were angels. It's, you know, or some kind of religious touch to it. And I think that was just the difference in, in upbringings and the different sort of worlds that they were brought up in, so, you know. So how do they look back on it now? Well, I don't think we've spoke to them since, to be honest with you. Um, I, I know that they were totally... Muriel used to ring the, the elderly lady quite a lot, and all she wanted to do was talk about her sighting because they were ridiculed and they, they were just happy that somebody... Were, weren't laughing at them and uh, uh, for want of a better word were taking them seriously because you know they weren't after fame and fortune and this was 1994 but we've got to say that the world has changed in a quantum way since then i, I used to work on a news desk in london uh, doing news on, on the, the chris tarrant show it was a, a music show in london on capital back in those days um and you know anything like this was regarded as completely wacko back then and the people who were behind stories like that uh, were also regarded as wacko i think things have changed a little bit now um, I and I think that's probably for the better. You know, even if these things have a perfectly rational explanation, we should at least be able to talk about them without laughing at the people who experience these things. You tell a really chilling story, not far from that story in the book, page 35. Um, and this is not something from the 1940s, the era of Foo Fighters or anything like this. This is the pilot uh, on page 35 who saw something weird in the sky near Filing Dales. Um, he appeared to freeze stationary in his plane in the sky, but his instruments showed him straight and level. But there's more than that. It's rather like those commercials you see on TV at night, you know, the shopping channels, they say. But there's more. There's definitely more to this story because he had apparently missing time. This thing started in daylight and ended in darkness, but with very little time elapsing. What was this about? This is a fabulous story, and you're, you're correct. He, he was flying a, a vintage aircraft, and I spoke to him literally two days ago because he's agreed to let me interview him on tape, you know, record him, because I want to use it as part of a talk I'm doing at the Outer Limits Conference in Hull next year. And he, he was in a vintage aircraft, and it wasn't equipped or, or licensed for night flying. So he'd just gone for a jolly up the coast and ended up near Filing Dales and was on his way back. Now, this guy thought that he'd got enough time to land. He was at a small airstrip in Burton Fleming called uh, Willie Howe Farm. Now, anybody familiar with Willie Howe? It's probably one of the most fam famous burial mounds in the UK, if not the most famous, attributed to unexplained happenings. But we'll not stay with Willie Howe. So he, he's flying home. I can't remember the exact point that he looks at the sun setting and thinks, yeah, I've left myself enough time. And... He sort of looks to his right, and he sees another sun. And he's thinking, I'm sort of confused. He looked, and then he could see the sun setting. Then he saw another sun. And he's trying to work out what he's actually looking at, he said. And then his best analogy was, although he gave me another one the other day, but in the book he said it was as though someone had applied the brakes as hard as you could in a car without skidding, and the plane stopped in the air. 
the other when we when I spoke the other day, he said it was like flying into a cobweb. He said, I, I said, I'm just trying to comprehend how to explain what happened. He said, and I looked, he said, and the plane's not, it's losing altitude. It's not going any higher. The revs are staying the same. He said, and I just can't understand it. He says, and then suddenly I, I must have blacked out. Mm. He said, because when I came to, it was night. He said, and I thought, what do I do? Do I try and continue and fly towards Humberside Airport? He said, luckily, he knew the area well enough and he could get his bearings by looking at Flamborough Lighthouse and sort of knew roughly where he was. And when he arrived at, at his home airstrip at Willie Howe Farm, there was a farmer with lights on actually working in the fields. And he put it down in a field. He had to miss some, uh, he says, whatever it is, cave, 30, some power lines. Uh, I'm sorry because I haven't got the information in front of me. He had to, he, that was his only worry, that he would miss these power lines as he put the aircraft down. And he managed to put the aircraft down, and he can't explain it. I think he said he lost one and a half hours of time. I mean, I, I, again, there's a story where you can be asking yourself quite legitimately, how does he see that now? Because that was a terrifying thing. If he thinks he blacked out in the sky and he has missing time, that is something that's going to stay with you forever. Without a doubt, and not only that, this is another curious one. Is when he when he checked his fuel when he landed the plane, he'd not he'd not used any more fuel. He'd not used the extra one and a half hours of fuel. Yet yet he recalls the the aircraft coming to a stop in the sky in this cobweb type effect where it or, or putting the brakes on without crashing, and looking at the instruments and the aircraft was still flying at the same speed but it wasn't moving if that makes sense listeners was this reported to air traffic control as no, far as you he, know he didn't do it mm. um, <clears throat> you, you, you know, say he didn't do it well well no for once for one thing he said nobody would believe him mm. and he also said he weren't equipped and he weren't licensed in this aircraft for night flying and how would he explain that he just he said so it were best to say nothing mm. Well, listen, you've got people in vastly different places all over this country listening to you uh, tonight. Um, Michigander, who is one of my tweeters from the United States, uh, listens every week and is absolutely entranced by this. Uh, my good mate from British Forces Broadcasting, Chris Pearson, is listening in Germany tonight. Hope you're doing well, Chris. Uh, he's fascinated by this and he knows all the military bases, uh, works at a lot of them. So you're definitely winning tonight, Paul. Uh, we're going to do some more strangeness with you from this book called Truth Proof. I cannot recommend it highly enough. Paul, there is so much in this book, and we're not going to have time for all of it, so we need to get you back on. Um, also, because you've got another edition coming out, haven't you? That's correct, yeah. Uh, I'm sorry for being a bit boring with the title, people, but it's called Truth Proof to the Outer Nowhere. And, yeah, it's basically more of the same. I've, I've written a third one as well, which is about alien abduction. Mm. Uh, and that the second one, the third will follow quite quickly after, if I'm being truthful. Well, you, listen, people are loving you who are tweeting, and I'm, I haven't done everybody's, but uh, thank you very much for your response. Aid is the latest, he just says, uh, loving it. So, you know, it's going well. Yes. All right. Um, I said we'd talk about the missing people. This is serious and disturbing stuff. 11 missing persons cases, all in recent years. Um, where do we start? We can do some of them. There is uh, John Deakin uh, in 2004. This is, you know, they're all very sad stories. His wife said, how did he vanish from the face of the earth? He vanished, but his sandwiches, his walking boots and his kit were still in his car. He had no reason to run away from home. That, that's correct. And, and I'll quickly say that this has probably been the most difficult thing to research and write about because of, I've got full respect for the people that, that have gone missing and in, in the, in the tragic thing, tragedies that are left behind and their families have got to deal with it. But John Deakin parked up. Uh, November the 4th, 2004 at Flambury, paid for a day's parking. He was an avid walker. It's something he'd done many times in the past, and he'd just never been seen since. And um, you, you said 11 men, Howard, but since writing Truth Proof, there's more. And I'd, I'd also like to stress that although Flambury and Bempton uh, have, have been known for suicides, I <clears throat> pointed out, after going through archives in Bridlington, that it's no more a suicide spot than anywhere else in the country. What happens is it becomes a prominent area because you've got the Coast Guard, you've got the Air Sea Rescue, you've got the Fire Brigade, you've got every professional service looking for these people. If somebody goes missing in Bridlington Town, you've just got the police looking for them usually. Uh, so, I've, And I've ruled out suicides. Anybody who's 
who's sort of had an history of depression or left notes or, or been any any anything to suggest that I've, I've, I've avoided it. So and, and indeed, in one of the cases that you look at, and this is a sad case, they're all sad cases of an 18-year-old, um, he vanished after uh, he'd been researching RAF Bempton. There's that name again. Um, he had an interest in a, an abandoned bunker there, which uh, sounds fascinating and a little chilling in itself. Um, he parked the family Clio car, but if he was going to run away from home or do anything, you know, so drastic as to, you know, to consider perhaps taking his own life. Um, he wouldn't have paid for a number of days parking in the car park there and then vanished. You just wouldn't, if you were in a desperate state like that, you wouldn't buy a parking ticket for, what was it, three days, maybe four days. Um, you obviously had some kind of plan. Something happened. Well, he, he actually bought a parking ticket for a, for a day, Howard. Uh, but he paid early morning, he paid for a day's parking. Mm -hmm. His last known whereabouts, his last movements at home, he was looking on the computer at uh, a website about the satanic graffiti and the satanic activities in RAF Bempton after it closed in the in 1970. And did he totally vanish? Were there no sightings yeah, of him at no all? No sight but of him whatsoever since. There was no suggestion that he were going to Bempton. He, he, he was quite a well-adjusted young man. I think he worked, he, he worked at Bishop Burton College or he was a student there. Uh, you know, a qualified driver. And he went on his own by Ab all accounts. Absolute tragedy for his family, who still have no idea what happened. His, his, his parents, out of all the missing people, and I've never spoke to his parents, but they worked tirelessly to, to, to keep his name prominent in the mainstream. But as, as most of these missing men from around this area, after a few months, it just the, the media moves on, even the local media. Well, we can say his name. It's 18-year-old Russell Bowling, B-O-H-L-I-N-G. Look, look up that case. It is strange and disturbing, and my thoughts are with his family and anybody who knows him. Um, there is a man called David Bins, uh, who is one of these missing people. He, too, vanished seemingly off the face of the earth, and all in the same area, and all recent. Yeah, interesting. When Russell, I'll get to David Bins. When Russell Bowling went missing, they knew he'd been looking at images of the, of the Bempton bunker, but nobody searched that bunker for five days. David Bins went missing six months and seven days later, and the first thing they did was search the bunker. Uh, I don't that know that seems I'm a talking. bit random, doesn't it? It does, really, and I think, I mean, I'm not saying that Russell Bowling or any trace of Russell would have been in the bunker, but it really should have been searched as, as, as a priority, uh, just in my opinion. You know, and as I say, David Bin's never been seen again, you know, and there's, there's just so many. Simon Hodgson in 2014, mm. he's never been seen again. Edward Machin uh, in, in 2014, 23rd of January, never been seen again. And, and this this man, Edward Machin, you talk about in 2014, it's only three years ago, for goodness sake. Um, again, we get the name of RAF Bempton because his train journey was interrupted, if I've read the book right here, and I only speed read the book today. But um, it was interrupted, and he ended up having to go past Bempton, uh, and then he vanished without trace. What, so what, his what train journey ended early. He had to go past Bempton. There was a train. There was a train. There was a fault with the train, and it broke down at Scarborough. And a taxi brought him to Bempton because that's where he was going. And he ended up on Cliff Lane at Bempton. And the the CCTV of the town crier, a uh, town crier cottage, saw him walking up Bempton to on Cliff Lane. The only place to go on Cliff Lane is to the nature reserve and to the the cliffs of Bempton. Never been seen since. What's interesting, Howard, is seven days later, sixteen miles up the coast. Nigel Savage from Hull had gone, took his two dogs for a day's fishing, never been seen since. This isn't Midsummer Murders. Hmm. This is... It, and it's, know, all, it's all in the same area. These are all tragedies. And, of course, media attention moves on. And it's only people like you who put these together. Howard, I don't even think the police put it together because... I mean, we're, we're not saying that they... We are not saying that they are connected because we don't know that. But it, they are worthy of more investigation. That we can say. Doubt, and I'd like to stress that I'm not saying these these disappearances are UFO related or anything else. I really don't have a clue what is 
what is responsible for these men's But in, in some of the cases, there is no indication of, uh, of anybody who may be having issues, depression, that sort of stuff. You know, these are human tragedies. Uh, we will talk more about this, of course. I just want to do very, very quickly, uh, Matt, my producer, sorry, I know I'm overrunning a bit, but um, there is a story in the book, just to lighten it up slightly. Um, there was off the coast of Scarborough, and because I'm a complete radio nut, I know this, but there was a pirate radio ship. Now, uh, the northwest of England and the southeast had Radio Caroline and, uh, you know, various ships like that. Um, Yorkshire had its own. It was called Radio 270 off Scarborough. Um, and there were people, um, a friend of mine uh, in radio, Paul Burnett, who used to be a Radio 1 DJ, also used to work at various other stations. Um, Paul worked on that, so I can ask him about this. But you say that there was the crew of Radio 270, which was off the coast of Scarborough, broadcasting to the north of England, reported seeing a UFO hovering above the ship. That's correct. It was early in 1966. And what's interesting is, uh, I think it's Paul Rustling mm. and Chris Dannett who mm. also worked on the boat. And Paul Rustling, very well known in radio circles, yeah. Yeah, well, they call it. I spoke to Paul. He's come. Uh, at first, Paul was skeptical, and and then he did a bit of digging, and he found he found. Oh, it's a, it's his exact words were it were widely talked about at the time, and while they were on air, they talked about a, a, a luminous sphere of light low in the sky above the boat. And what's interesting is, and I'll not say his name, but a retired Coast Guard from Hornsey, who I contacted, told me that when they were in the station, they used to listen to uh, Radio 270 and the boat that rocked. And they actually listened with absolutely avid interest while the UFO was being reported in 1966. It's quite quite an interesting, interesting story. And I think the light ship at Spurn Point, which is basically a floating lighthouse, also reported a UFO on the same night or seeing an unidentified flying object. So, yeah, a, a, a wonderful story. Even in my own field. Well, listen, if you want me to, I'll, I'll try and make contact with Paul Burnett. I know he was on that boat for, I think, most of the time it was it was there. Um, I was told... Oh, the, the DJ, Alan West, wrote about yes. this in a book. Well, Alan West, very, very famous to those of us who know our pirate radio history. Uh, Alan West was one of the great, uh, I think he's still around, great voice, great jock, great DJ. Uh, Paul Sinclair, we're out of time, unfortunately, and I've only just scratched the surface of this book. I cannot speak, and I don't have an interest in it, I'm not on a bung, I cannot speak highly enough, and I have to tell you that you have got tonight some of the greatest rolling response to what you've been saying here so i know you were a little trepidatious about coming on the radio but you've done a great job and you know your independent research can only be applauded by people like me i mean i do research for a living but uh, you leave me standing when it comes to that so well done paul sinclair the book the Thank book you. i've said it again the book the book <laughs> i've gone back to be in liverpool tonight i might as well go the old og mightn't i uh, the book is called truth proof the truth that leaves no proof and how do we get it uh, there are people in america who are tweeting here how would they get it and how do people generally get it well, it's, it's available on amazon it's available through my website truthproof.webs i think it's dot com or it might just be truthproof.webs and uh, obviously, I think Waterstones do it, but it has to be ordered, and uh, and the library service will do it as well, because I know a few libraries have bought them, but Amazon primarily. It used to be available overseas on Amazon, for some, but for some reason, the I'm not being able to sell them overseas, not because they've been bad or anything like that. I'm just having difficulty with Amazon. Well, so the American audience have ordered them through the UK and they've gone that way. Well, I knew we have to see what we can do about that because great book um, and is, is a fab it would make a great Christmas present for someone and I am not on a bung. Paul Sinclair, we must get you on again and as, as they say in Yorkshire, you've done us proud.